All right, we're going to pick back up where we left off, talking about the labor, and we're going to start in Matthew 23. <clears throat> in Matthew 23, Jesus has given his opinion of man's religion. You want to know what he thinks about man's outward religion? Read Matthew 23. And he's talking to Pharisees. Now, don't get the idea that Pharisees were, uh, you know, drinking, smoking, gambling, chasing women. That ain't who he's condemning. That's who he spent most of his time with preaching to, was the drinking, smoking, gambling, and the women. The ones he's talking to here are the holiest in society. The ladies all have on big hats at Sunday dinner. The men have on nice suits and they look down their nose at everybody else and they think they have a form of righteousness that other men don't have. They look around and like the Pharisee in the temple, they say, thank God our family's not like that family. Someone told me just a few weeks ago, you know, every family today has got drugs are just horrible in our country and every family's affected by it and things and it affects the whole family. I said, yeah, I said, every family's affected by it. And a lady said, not my family. And I thought to myself, well, look out. You're going to have it here pretty soon. Big statement like that. But the point being is that's the attitude. The Pharisee didn't eat this, didn't touch that, didn't go here, didn't associate with him, didn't dip, didn't date women that dipped. He, you know what I mean? He's totally avoiding all that. The very word Pharisee means a separator. And it doesn't mean separate anything in himself. He separates from other people, right? Now in verse uh, 25, Jesus says to him, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Now if we had a cup, let's say somebody in here said, Hey, I'd like to get some coffee. I said, Alright, get a mug. And you say, well, where's the clean mugs at? I said, well, we don't have any clean ones. The, the mugs are all in the sink. They're all dirty. Just get a dirty mug. Would you want a dirty mug? No. Would you rather have a clean styrofoam cup? Yes. But what if I had a solid gold mug? If it was clean. If it's dirty, you still don't want it, do you? See, the vessel ain't got nothing to do with it. It's what you're putting in the vessel that you're interested in, right? What is the vessel that we're dealing with? It's ourselves, no, right? How are you going to cleanse that which is constantly emitting uncleanness? You can't. But the Pharisees thought they had. So Jesus is not telling them here something that they ought to do. He's telling them here to go try that which is impossible. He does this over and over. Remember, remember when the young ruler, the rich young ruler, come to him and said, What must I do to gain mm -hmm. eternal life? Okay. He would, yeah, that's the answer. Ain't nothing you can do. you got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus said to him, well, what says the law? And he went, you remember what he said, but finally Jesus said, well, i tell you what. If thou will be perfect, if you will be perfect, keep the law. And the man said, which ones? And he said, well, thou shalt not kill, shalt not blah, 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 and love your neighbor as yourself. And the man said, all these things have I done from my youth up. Was Jesus telling him to go be perfect or was he trying to show him he was not perfect? Mm -hmm. He was trying to use the law for what was intended for to convict the man. The man then said, Jesus said, oh, you're perfect? We'll sell everything you got and give it to your neighbor if you love your neighbor as yourself. And what did the man say? He went away sad. He wasn't willing to. Jesus wasn't telling that man, you've got to sell everything to get into the kingdom. People teach that. No, he was not. He was using the law lawfully. Would you expect him to use anything unlawfully? Yeah. Paul said there's only one way you can use the law lawfully to indict a man of his own guilt. That When he told that man, go sell everything you have, inside, what did that man have? He had a decision to make. Right. If he really loved his neighbors himself, he wouldn't have any starving neighbors, would he? No hungry neighbors. But what did he decide? Hmm, maybe I hope, I pray we meet him in heaven and he found out that day I'm not perfect. I don't know. He never said. But the Pharisee thought that's what he was. So Jesus is telling him here, you're trying to clean the outside of the cup when the problem's inside it, right? Now think about me and you. I'm going to show you the same exact thing. Go over to... Uh, I tell you, go to 2 Timothy. Second Timothy, we'll just start in verse 14. 
Which chapter? 2. 2 Timothy 2, 14. Alright, now Paul's talking to Timothy. Is Timothy a saved man? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. One more of Paul always instructing Timothy on quit this, <coughs> quit that, don't do this, don't do that. Because he does. Tells him over and over how he ought to live, doesn't he? Why? He's already saved. If his sins don't matter, why would he just say hallelujah, eat, drink, and be merry? Because there's work to be done and the, the outward appearance matters, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So he says in verse 14, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now Timothy's job as a preacher or anyone that's going to share the word of God is not to get in an argument to defend your doctrine. That's not it. Folks, men do this all the time and it's not fruitful for anyone. Don't enter into those strivings. You know, if someone says, well, I think, blah, 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 if it ain't changing the cross, let them think it. What do you want to talk about? Some peripheral doctrine or the cross of Jesus Christ? So let them talk about because they'll come up with anything to deflect you. They want to get it off of the cross. So he says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Then could Timothy be ashamed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And all of a sudden we've got the idea that that says rightly dividing parts of the Bible from other parts. That's totally out of context. Look, keep it in context and watch what he says. Verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings. Then what's he telling him to divide? The truth from error. You decide by the word of God what's true and what's not true. Shun profane and vain babblings. They will increase unto more ungodliness. Then could Timothy increase in ungodliness? Yes, yes folks. We've we got to watch this. Their word will eat as doth a canker. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Who concerning the truth have erred. Then were they in the truth? Yeah. Yes. And they've erred from the truth. Watch what they're doing. Saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So then he's telling Timothy how not to get off the path, isn't he? Is he telling him that these men have erred by teaching Hebrews through Revelation? No. no. They've erred by teaching something that's not true. We've got to discern the truth from a lie, don't we? What's truth? This book, the Word of God. What's a lie? Everything else. I don't care what it is. The weatherman said there's a 90% chance of rain today. Every If it rains today, that guy's a liar. Because if it rains, that's a 100% chance, isn't it? Right? I mean, didn't it? Now it says, verse uh, 19, Nevertheless, even though they've erred, watch what it says next, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. What is the foundation? Christ, the Word of God. Folks, if Christ is in you, is any way God can turn you away? No. no. He said, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. What did Paul say happens to a believer the moment you trust Christ? Sealed. Yes. Sealed. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When God looks at that person, that person's got his seal on them, and can God deny them? No. no. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Is that instruction to save people to depart from iniquity? Yes. Yeah, then can we get an iniquity? Yes. Folks, if you don't think you can get an iniquity, you ain't being honest with yourself. Now look, there's a big difference between sins and iniquity. Can you <coughs> commit a sin without knowing it? Yeah. Yes, you can. We do it all the time. Me and you are guilty of so many things right now that we don't even consider because we're not spiritually mature enough yet. But can you commit iniquity without knowing it? Mm -hmm. Iniquity is that which is your will to do. Iniquity is I'm going to do this in spite. Now he says, depart from iniquity, but... Even though we can get into iniquity, but in a great house. What house? The house of God. The church, the body of Christ. It ain't a building. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and earth. You know what that means? In the nicest house, there's all kind of vessels in there. Some are real great vessels and valuable, and some aren't very valuable. But would you want a solid gold shovel to dig in your garden? Solid gold shovel wouldn't be good. Gold is soft. You'd bend that, wouldn't you? So then are there certain vessels that are fitted for certain purposes? Sure. You remember that next time you're talking to one of your brothers or sisters in Christ and you want to judge something they're doing. You let God fit them for the purpose and let God deal with that. Don't you turn that mirror around and burn them with it. You look at yourself. 
He said, In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. You know, I would put that in, in today's language, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but I want it to have the effect it's going to have. We've got wash rags in this house, and we've got toilet paper. You see what it's saying? Mm -hmm. Is a wash rag designed to do the job of toilet paper? No. Well, Lexi's got some real nice stuff. She's got an Afghan blanket she crocheted that's so soft. I'd rather wipe my butt with that. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> look, I, I don't, but I'm, I, look, I don't want this to be offensive. Now, I want you to see what I mean. Just because of its appearance, that's not its design use, is it? What's toilet paper's use? It serves a purpose, and you've got it in your house, don't you? You leave it up to God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who's in the body of Christ and who's not, right? You leave it up to God what their job is and what your job is. That's the biggest problem me and you face is when we start looking at the other guy. Don't look at the other guy. That's not your business. I'm going to give you all an example. A man one time was being attacked by some folks because he accepted people that said they believed Christ. They said, but they believe this, this, and this. He said, look, all that other stuff they believe, no, I don't believe that, but if they believe Jesus Christ died for their sins, I'm going to be with them for eternity, so why can't I be with them in this life? After all, think about the, the, the ridiculousness of separating from everybody that doesn't have your doctrine. So in other words, I believe that man's caught in a snare, and I'm going to separate from him. Shouldn't you go over there and try and snip him, cut him out of the snare? Right? If you really care about him, if a brother or sister in Christ? Sure. Well, this man went and had dinner with these folks. And they were talking about, well, you know, so-and-so doesn't do this, this, and this. And he does this. And they don't do this. And he's talking about other people in Christ. He said, well, I'm going to tell you all about a man. This man said he got saved about age 16. And the man went into uh, to school and, and, you know, got educated, seminary and all. But when he got out, the man's kind of backwards and awkward. He's not very social. He has a kind of gruff personality. And the man winds up spending 20 years in his study. He rarely even went to church. He said he, he, he just didn't, you know, he rarely went there. But he spent 20 years in his study and hardly ever talked to anyone about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said, oh, that's horrible. That poor man, right? He said, do any of y'all ever uh, use any study aids? And they said, well, sure, yeah, we use, you know, this. And they said, what's the most valuable study aid you have? And they said, well, probably the concordance. We all know a concordance is a good study aid. If you ain't got one, you tell me, I'll give you one. It lists every word in the Bible and where they appear, and it's, it's a great study aid, right? He said, well, would you, what's your favorite concordance? You know, there's Vines and Youngs and Fairs. They all said, no, the most valuable is Strong's. Strong put a, a number to every word where you can look them up like that, can't you? And they said, well, yeah, you use it. They said, oh, that saved us immense amount of work. That book, it has me too. I love using it. And he said, well, <clears throat> the man that I just described to you that spent 20 years in his study was Augustus Strong. Think about it. He was learning. Hey, was he serving a purpose in the body of Christ? Yeah, yes. Who are you to judge his purpose? You know not. Let the Lord deal with that. We are not to judge other people's ministries. We are supposed to judge ours, aren't we? Now he says, In a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. I could say, but in the church, the body of Christ, there's not only eloquent preachers, but there's backwoods, hard stuttering, uh, poor speech, couldn't I? I could say in the body of Christ, there's not only the one teaching the class, but there's the ones that make the class possible, aren't there? In the body of Christ, there's not only the one teaching, there's those that showed up to listen, without which a class wouldn't be necessary. In the body of Christ, there's what God desires, isn't it? He put the members in there. Let the members uh, just trust the Lord. Now, he says, verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, these are the iniquitous doctrines he's talking about, not these other vessels, Folks, if a man therefore purge himself, well, wait, we're supposed to be purged when we're saved to get into the house of God. Do we need constant purging? Yes. Mm -hmm. Y'all, anybody ever purge crawfish? Yes. Yeah. You purge crawfish, this is the, in my mind, this is the perfect example of what we're doing on a daily basis. You take crawfish, you put them in a, in a bucket, basket, whatever you got, and you put fresh water in there, don't you? Best way to purge them is put a hose in there and turn it on slightly and let it just keep running. What are you actually doing? 
take it anymore. Clean it inside. You clean it, but literally you flushing the waste out of them, aren't you? Mm -hmm. How are you doing it? You putting in fresh water. What? How do me and you flush these things out? The living word, folks. The water, the word of God. So he says, let a man therefore purge himself from these. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet or fit for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Then can a vessel in the house of God become unuseful to God? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Then what does it need to do to remain useful? Get back in the world. Get back in the world. You get to be purged. Turn back to the Lord and let the Lord use you. Now watch what he tells him next. Watch these things. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender stripes. In other words, divide that which is foolish from that which is edifying, right? This is a daily ongoing thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Tell you what, go, go over to uh, flip to Malachi real quick. Malachi 3. You know, I find that Malachi comes up at most classes that I teach during the week. At some point at these different homes that I go to, Malachi comes up. Y'all know why Malachi? I was unaware of this till I started going to these places. Y'all know why Malachi comes up? Because it's preached to them every week about tithing, isn't it? Robbing God. Everybody's heard that, right? Robbing God. So then what are they preaching to them people? Law of Moses, aren't they? What did Paul say? If a man's going to get circumcised and keep the law, he's got to keep the whole law. Well, then the woes that preach that tithe they need to preach all that too, don't they? You know, the idea in Israel was you give 10% or else you're in violation. That's law, isn't it? Well, you know what the New Testament says? 100% belongs to the Lord. I'm not trying to get 100% of your money. I wouldn't take it if you offered it to me. My point is it all belongs to the Lord. Anything I give in the Lord's service, I ain't giving the Lord anything. He gave it to me. How foolish is it to think I'm carrying something down there that would make the Lord happy with me? I ought to be happy with what the Lord gave me and willingly let it be used. Now it says in uh, Malachi 3, remember Malachi, by the way, is written to the priests. Starting in chapter uh Halfway through 1 and 2, it's all about the priests. Were those priests of Israel sanctified and cleansed to begin their service? Yes. And what had they become? Filthy and defiled. Right. They were robbing God. This never was meant to apply to a congregation. It applies to the priesthood. You want to use this verse today? Spin it right around and point it at preachers. Because that's who's robbing God today. The priests were taking all the best of the sacrifices, weren't they? They got the best of the tenth. Went to the priest, right? And what was the priest supposed to do? Take the best of that tenth and offer it to God. And what did the priest do? He kept the best and gave the broken leg, the blind, the halt, the withered. To In other words, he gave God the riffraff. He was robbing God. It's like the man that sits up there and preaches all this and... Uh, Somebody told me a story one time, said a guy got up and said, this is what I want to hear. And he tore a check in the intercom. You make that noise. That's what I want to hear. Then what does he do with it? Buys a real nice Mercedes and fine suits and alligator shoes, and right? Fine home. I built a pool for a preacher one time. $300,000 house, $100,000 pool. Does that sound like somebody using what God's blessed them with to spread the word of God? Yeah. Folks, day, but one reason we're in this world we're here to glorify God. We're not here to glorify ourselves. Now it says here, he's talking to these people that are robbing, uh, have robbed God. In verse uh, 3, he says what he's going to do. Malachi 3, 3 says, And he, it's Christ, shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that, or in order that, they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. They had become unclean and couldn't even offer anything to the Lord, could they? Then what did they need? Purging. Purging. Look, folks, the priest could not come in here except he washed. Can you go to God in prayer with a filthy conscience? Mm -hmm. Try it. I'm not interested in that. It's a try. That's why so many times in prayer it's added the thing about forgive. Like Matthew 6, he's teaching them to pray. He said, 
forgive men their trespasses. In other words, how am I going to go to God and ask God to forgive me when I won't forgive you? Amen. And that don't mean I've got to do that to be saved. It means if I'm saved, then is there anything you do to me that I ought to really be offended by? My flesh gets offended, but if I sit down and think about it a second, you know what I'll say? Well, he just did to me what I did to so-and-so last year. Ain't that how it works? He just did the very thing that I was thinking about doing to him. Usually when we get mad, it's because he beat me to the punch. That's usually what the old man thinks. But the point is, when we go to God in prayer, folks, one of the first things we should say to God at night is, Lord, don't let my filthiness keep me from coming to you. Lord, cleanse me of that stuff. Bring me into fellowship with you. Don't look. You're going to go to the Word of God and say, Lord, show me the truth in here so I can show old so-and-so what an idiot he is. You think God's going to guide you in that? No, that's not. See, that's you see the, the thing. So then where we have access to God, we come into the sanctification, the holy place, which is fellowship. We don't have that when we get unclean. And if we won't clean, we can't come in there. Hey, I got involved with a doctrine that said, look, your sins were all paid for at the cross. And God doesn't see sin today. It's all been destroyed, lock, stock and barrel. It ought not even be mentioned. Do whatever you want to do. God ain't watching. Now, they didn't say that, but that's what they taught them. Well, guess what? None of them, none of them, when you talk, ever know about sanctification. None of them exhibit any growth in the Lord. They're some of the most hateful people. They're by, they're spying. I don't mean they're lost. They've got caught up in a trap and they can't get out of the trap because they say the thing that has to be done ain't supposed to be done. They say, you don't ever need to talk to God about your sins. That's done. I don't confess my sin and ask God to save me from hell and cleanse the penalty. I ask Him to save me from the daily taint of it, to, to cleanse me from the power it has over me, to render me useless in the Lord's service. Lord, get rid of it. David said, bring it to the surface and boil it away. But what did he say he was going to do to Malachi here in order that their offerings could be accepted again? Purge. Purge. And what's he telling us? Purge yourself. In other words, I can wait to the judgment seat of Christ and all the drought is going to be purged. Or if we purge ourselves through going to the Lord with it now, can He use us now? And at the judgment seat of Christ, what will you receive? Reward. Isn't that a better way? Sure. Hey, he, my granny always used to say, do it one of two ways, the easy way or the hard way, but it's going to get done, isn't it? Well, which would you rather do? Come on, folks, let's go to God voluntarily and let's, let's do this thing with Him. Now, in Malachi, he said he's going to do this that they might be clean. I want to show you an example. Flip over, if you would, to uh, Colossians 3. Because immediately somebody is already saying, yeah, but Paul. Well, let's go see what Paul said. Colossians 3. told these people they're risen with Christ they're saved but in verse 5 he says mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth what's mortify mean put it to death I mean just put it to death mortify it watch what he tells them to mortify fornication uncleanness inordinate affection evil concupiscence covetousness which is idolatry anybody got any of those yeah I mean Colossians 3 5 is a very serious verse isn't it how in the world would he be telling us to put those things away, save people, if it weren't possible to have them? Of course it's possible. The Corinthians had all of them, didn't they? So then, does our manner of daily activity matter? Certainly it matters. Now watch this list. Fornication. Well, somebody would say, well, I don't have that one, and you're lying. Uncleanness. Anybody's heart still beating? What did Jesus Christ say your human heart was? defiled. Can that go on the altar of God? It's, it's unclean, isn't it? All right, but did He promise to give us a new heart? Yeah. He did, and a new heart He gave us, and your new heart is clean, and your new heart can be cleaned. Your old heart can't be cleaned. He says, inordinate affection. You know, I see this most often in our world. You talk about un, out of order affection, right? Got a next door neighbor going to hell and can care less. Got a dog across the street chained up and I want to do something about it. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, there used to, we used to have, we had TV that turned on the commercial, and there was one commercial they put on there, and they would play that song, It's in the Arms of an Angel, and they have a dog there with his eye missing, and I'd start crying every time. Get it off the TV. I don't want to see that. But I, I don't have that towards human beings. Not my old man, I don't. Slowly but surely, little by little, I'm being taught that I can honestly care about other people, but not in my flesh. But in the new creature, you can now he says inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, or covetousness. Anybody here says you ain't got covetousness, you really lying. Covetousness doesn't mean you've coming up with a plan to take what's your neighbor's. That's stealing. Covetous is to desire that which you do not have. Anybody got plans right now for something you want to buy? Y'all know how we get. Doesn't that thrill us while the, the while we're looking and shopping? Boy, that's thrilling, isn't it? You get it, and then what? Now it'll be yeah, it's nothing. I mean, seriously. Yeah, you think, boy, if I could just get this saw, man, I could do this and do that. And you get the saw and use it, and it's sitting out there. You see what I mean? What do you start then? You start thinking, well, if I could just get this drill. I mean, that's it's it's a it's the old nature of trying to fulfill a void that's there, and the void can't be filled with anything physical. So he says in verse six. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, into which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath. Is he telling them to put them off? Yep. Then is it up to them? Yep. It's up to them to be willing to put them off, and yep. it's up to God to put them off. Yep. He says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Then can save people lie? You better believe it. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. Not was renewed, is daily renewed. Does your new man need renewing? Does your old man need renewing daily? Yes, we all eat and sleep, don't we? Does your new man need renewing? Yes. Yes. Well, what do you feed your old man? Food. food. Physical food, don't you? Yeah. What do you feed your new man? Spiritual, word. spiritual food, the Word. You know, you get somebody that's not growing in Christ, and I guarantee I can tell you why. How much time you spend with the Word of God? That's, that's the answer every time. You get somebody that's not... Uh, that's miserable, they're in Christ and they're miserable or they got problems, the first place to say, okay, well, how much time do you spend with the Lord each day? Now, there are people that eat once a week. Once a week on Sunday morning they eat. If you ate physically that way, what kind of shape would you be in? You'd be in bad shape, wouldn't you? So he says, they have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So your old man is renewed at, in the... In, with physical things after the image of the one that physically created you, your earthly father, right? But your new man is created a new creature in the likeness of God. Then can your new creature sin? If it could sin, God can sin. But your old creature is nothing but sin. And both are dwelling in one vessel, aren't they? So did, did Paul say that these people had already put on the new man? He did, didn't he? Then someone say, see there, it's a done deal. This stuff you're talking about is foolishness. We'll go to Ephesians chapter 4. Lexi, I just seen a head up there. Yeah. Alright, Ephesians 4, verse... Uh, oh. The whole thing is about how they ought to live. Let's pick up in verse 20. Alright, Ephesians 4 verse 20 he says, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be you have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man. He didn't say they already did it, he's telling them to do it, isn't he? Now wait a minute, is Paul nuts? I mean, come on. Come on. <laughs> Ask Paul, did Paul tell those people they've already put on the new man? And what's he telling them to do here? Put on the new man. How often we ought to put it on? Daily, Daily folks. You know me and you've got to do this. You wake up in the morning and you wake up naked in the old man. And what's the first thing you're going to have to do? 
You need to get your mind centered on the Lord. Put on the new man. In other words, start the day out talking to the Lord. Start the day out walking in the Lord and ask the Lord to guide you. He, he promised He would do it. He wants to do it. The only thing that keeps it from doing it is us. We won't will it and we won't believe it. So then Paul says, you've put it on, but you need to put it on. That kind of sounds crazy, doesn't it? But this is what this is about. This is constantly. Now there's one more phase of this. There's coming a day when I'm going to physically put on the new man, isn't there? When will that be? In the resurrection. Get a new body. So I've put it on. I need to put it on. And I will put it on. And that's always the case. All the way through scripture. I was saved. I'm being saved. I will be saved. I'm redeemed. I'm being redeemed. I shall be redeemed. Does that make sense so far? Hey, let's let's uh, get off of this for a second. Go cover. Go back to Exodus 38. There's an amazing thing in the, we won't have time to look at it in the book of Hebrews, but in the law they had what's called the red heifer. Y'all remember the red heifer offering? And what they would do is they'd offer this red heifer and then they would take the ashes with lard. They would make, it just come on my mind this week because Lexi likes making soap with all her oils and that stuff. And they would make soap out of it. She told me the other day, she said, you know, they say ashes is real good for soap. Well, that's what the red heifer was, folks. It was soap. And what did they use it for? Washing. What kind of washing? Every every just normal? No. When they broke the law and they're outside the camp, they couldn't come in, come in here. When they're somewhere else, they had those ashes and that thing that God was ordained and what was it made from? Blood sacrifice. And what did they do with it? They washed. The writer of Hebrews says that God would let that washing symbolically cleanse their flesh and they didn't die, right? Was that a symbolic cleansing of their flesh? Yeah. He says, but we got something better. We got the Word of God. We've got Jesus Christ and His blood, which won't cleanse your flesh. Never said He would, did He? Not one word in here about cleansing your old heart or flesh. He said, put it to death. But will the Word of God cleanse something better than your outward flesh? It cleanse your conscience. Even though I look in the mirror and I see this person that still has these sins and these issues, does that make my mind say, well, then you're not saved, you're going to hell? No, because I know Jesus Christ died for my sins. And all He requires of us is to believe on Him. If I will believe on Him in sincerity and trust what He did for me, you get saved. It's, it's done. But then God begins the process of starting to work on you, doesn't He? So now we've got this thing back here in Exodus. <clears throat> um, 38.8 He made the lava of brass and the foot of it of brass of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now there's several things about this real quick. Looking glass again is mirrors. But <clears throat> when they make this lava of the women assembling at the door of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of Moses ain't built yet. He's telling them how to build it here. He had not set it up yet. <clears throat> then what tabernacle are they at? What are they even doing? Look what Moses did. Go back to chapter 33. They had a tent, folks, where they worshiped God. There ain't much said about it. It's like the, the gospel prior to the law. There ain't much said, but we know it was back there. <clears throat> In uh, Exodus 32, they make the golden calf and they defile the place, don't they? They totally defile the camp and God's going to kill them. And Moses steps in and, and as a type of Christ mediates. But look what it says in verse 7. Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. It came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Moses took their little temporary tent and put it outside the camp. Well, what does that show? Why didn't he leave it in the camp? Because it was defiled. The camp was defiled. Then were the people cut off from worship. Yep. What had cut them off? 
They're on the phone, but they made a golden they made a golden calf. Folks, God turned from them, didn't he? But it says these women assembled at the door. What women would do, you can find them in the scripture in uh, in 1 Samuel, look, ladies couldn't be priests. They couldn't do any of the service, but they would gather outside of there. And at this time, they <coughs> gathered with their looking glasses because that's what they learned in Egypt to go to the Egyptian temples with their glasses, right? But they would gather outside the door of the tabernacle to anything they could do. This is a, It was a pagan custom, and it continued. Remember when uh, Hannah went and Eli's sons were accused, the priests, Eli's sons were, were, they wound up dying, but they were accused of sleeping with the women that assembled at the tabernacle. Look, you had women that wanted to serve the Lord would meet out here, and they would just wait out here for anything they could do for the Lord, right? That's what these women were doing, but they got their looking glasses there. Now, what were those looking glasses to them? They looked in them, and what did they see? Self. Self. And what, come on, y'all know when a woman carries a mirror with her and she's saying look at this big zit i got today <laughs> no they cover that up right what's a woman carrying a mirror saying beautiful y'all know in the movies y'all seen in the movies a lady in the antebellum big huge dress walking around with her mirror it's a symbol of pride isn't it it's in other words i've looked in this mirror and i am thrilled with what i've seen does that make sense Okay. <clears throat> Did the Pharisees look in the Word of God and were they thrilled with what they saw about themselves? Yep, sure. They looked in there and said, We be Abraham's seed. We're the children of God. There's nothing unclean in us. And what did Christ say about them? Yes, it is. They're filthy, right? All right. How about churches today? Do people look in the Word of God and see things like that? They do, folks. People are taught this kind of stuff. And yet, what happens when a person gets saved? That which you used to look in that mirror and like what you saw, now you look in that mirror and you want to turn away, don't you? Mm -hmm. So at first, what do we do? We turn away. But what happens? If you're really saved, folks, God ain't going to let you turn away. Mm -hmm. You're coming back to that mirror. And when you look in that mirror now, what happens? You see yourself, you see yourself in reality. Right. You know, every mirror in the world is not an exact image. I don't care. There is a slight difference. Now, you can take it out to the extreme to see what I mean. Remember going to the uh, fun house and the mirrors? Yeah. Make you look this big? Way. Yeah, I want to find the one, Chris, that stretches you this way, right? <laughs> but the point is that's that they do that, don't they? They're, they're a reflection, but the way it's made, it's not a perfect reflection. Look, department stores know this. What do department stores knowingly do in the women's room? Right. They, they put the mirror in there to see things in the most flattering light, don't they? Well, what's the only true mirror that will show you the truth of what you're looking at? This book right here. Look over to James chapter 1. You know, it's fascinating. No man designed this book because no man would ever say things about himself like this book says. Y'all know what I mean. He, a man writes a book about himself and what does he say? Thing. Boy, he says all the greatest things about him, doesn't he? Come on, y'all go to a funeral. What do they say about people at funerals? All the best, wonderful, sweetest. Did they say that about him in life? No. <laughs> Look, nobody writes an autobiography and tells the rotten things on themselves. Not unless it, it's to be funny or to make show what a change they've made or something, right? But when this book was written, what does this book say about you? That we're awful. Now, I'm going to tell you all what it says, and, I'll, and uh, this is the worst case scenario for me and you, and it's true. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Literally, it says it's incurable. Now, the human heart is deceitful above more than anything. More than the devil himself, folks, the human heart is deceitful. Now, Satan is a cunning master at deception, isn't he? Not like your heart. Will your heart deceive you? Yes. Your human heart ain't going to deceive other people. Your mind will come up with a plan to do that. But who does the heart deceive? Me and you. Your human heart can look in this book and find goodness where it ought to find evil. It can find evil in others where it ought to look for goodness. Your human heart is so deceitful that there's no hope for it. It's incurable, the Bible says. Therefore, what did God say He would have to do if one person was going to go to heaven? Give us a new heart. And that's what He did. 
Now, James says here. James what? James 1, verse, uh, uh, let's see, uh, verse 21. Now, he's talking to saved people. Granted, he's, he's targeted as Jewish believers, but they're saved. That's, you can prove that from several places in, in the book here. But in verse 21, he says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness. And what's he telling them to do? Cleanse themselves. Yeah. Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. No, they didn't say save their spirit, did it? He's writing to save people. Save means deliver, folks. Can the word of God deliver your soul? You sure. better believe it can. You ever had just you ever get your soul in despair? Hope and worry? Yeah. Y'all know what it's like. When we get in despair, what's the only thing that'll really do away with it? Okay. The Word of God. Go to the Word of God. Now he says it's able to save or deliver your souls. Be you doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. There's that human heart. Will your human heart read the Word of God and then deceive itself into thinking you're right and perfect form with it? Yeah. It will. For if any be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. All right? Fellow goes and looks in the mirror, right? He beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. What's that work there? Is his memory just bad? No. no. The deceitful heart's working. Mm -hmm. You look and you see something you don't like, and I'm going to tell you what the old man starts doing immediately. You know, there's a uh, something about a human being that's fascinating. When you break a bone, right, what does the body immediately start doing? Yeah. It starts sending calcium to it to heal it up. It'll make it stronger where it can't break there. It'll break down or above it, but it ain't going to break there. Well, as soon as you spot uh, a problem, in your flesh, you know what your flesh will start doing? It'll start doing that same thing. It'll start thoughts, sending thoughts there to get the pain, get it off that spot. In other words, it'll start sending. The next thing you know, that thing which you saw in the Word of God to be wrong, you've now figured out how it's right and you did the right thing. Your heart will do that. It's deceitful above all things. And you become hardened to it. And then you become hardened to it. That's exactly right. It's amazing how our heart works, but David described it. He said that when the Lord brought a man, a saved man, now David was God's anointed, who begged him to cleanse him, by the way. But when you get to a point where, where this is going on, David said that God would bring a man under conviction and it was God that had broke the bone. And then what did he ask God to do? Heal, Heal the place which thou hast broken. You know one of the great broken bones in Scripture? David, a saved man, slept with Bathsheba, and tried, killed Uriah. We know the story. David, was David God's anointed man? Was he king of God's nation? Yeah. David couldn't be preacher in any church in Mobile today. They wouldn't let him. He couldn't be a deacon. They'd throw him out of most churches, wouldn't they? Yeah. He had an affair. Well, David was God's anointed. When Nathan came and told David that story, y'all remember about the man that took the guy's only sheep, David said, Let, that's it, let's kill him. Now that's me and you. We rise up, we recognize sin, we recognize the deserved punishment, don't we? Y'all know we look at a serial killer and say they ought to kill him, don't we? We recognize sin ought to be punished. Everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. But what about when it's our sin? Mm -hmm. Oh wait, now that's different, isn't it? <laughs> David rose up and said, okay, I just diagnosed that. That's sin, that's rottenness. We're going to kill him. And David, Nathan said, you're the man. And David said, no, 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 wait, hold on a minute. Now, no, you got it wrong. See, now, technically, Uriah and her were separated. Did he say all of that? No. What did David do? He admitted it. He said, yeah. Lord, you're right. God snapped that bone, didn't he? And when he snapped that bone, David was looking in the mirror. Did he like what he saw? No. But did he look away? No. He looked in that mirror and said, Lord, show me other stuff. What else is there in there, Lord? Show me. He said, search me, O Lord. See if there be any wicked way in me. Now I want you all to go to Psalm 51 before we stop. We're going to close with what David wrote at that time. Now remember, this is God's anointed man. This is the man that has already said... Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute his trespasses, 
Blessed is the man to whom God gives righteousness to. Did David know these things? Mm -hmm. This is God's anointed man. We're not talking about some ungodly... It's not. This is God's man. In Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. What's he basing this plea on? On God's Lord. mercy. Yeah. You know what he didn't say? Lord, I'm never going to do it again. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, see, that's going to the Lord bargaining, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Lord, I know I did this thing now, but don't forget all the other stuff I've done in your service. Did he say that? Mm -hmm. He said, Upon thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly or thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Is this a saved man begging God to do this? Yeah. Yes. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And you know that's amazing to me. I would say, well, it sure looked to me like you sinned against Uriah. He slept with his wife and then killed him. David's interested in what? He's interested in what he's done to the Lord. Right. Y'all remember a couple weeks ago we talked about when Peter denied the Lord that night? I would think in Peter's case, he probably thought, oh, I hope the other 11 don't find out. That ain't what was the problem. The problem was that the Lord knew. When Peter denied him that third time, it says Jesus and what he was undergoing, even all the persecution and penalty, turned and looked at Peter. Folks, I know it wasn't no stare of harsh justice. and heck, No, it wasn't. He turned and looked at Peter with a broken heart. How y'all reckon that affected Peter? When me and you get into these things and have these thoughts, you know, we ought to think about the Lord just looking at us like that because that's what He does. Amen. He said, I, verse 5, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, this is a man coming clean before the Lord, isn't it? You talk about a guy that knows himself. He's looked in the mirror and does he like what he sees? Yeah. So mm -hmm. is he going about to cover up the imperfections? Mm -hmm. He's asking God to get rid of them. Me and you look in a physical mirror, and then what's the purpose? Yeah, folks, we look in a mirror not to see what's pretty. We look in there to see what needs fixing, don't we? Hey, i got to fix my four hairs here and three here, and i got to do this and do that. Ain't that what we do? Now, he says, verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. How in the world could David say that if about his own human heart? The Bible says there's nothing clean in your inward heart, is there? Thou desirest uh, truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. God's going to show it to him. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. This is one of the most amazing things. That hyssop is a, it's a, look, it's a little shrub bush. And it still grows in the wall that's left over there, the wailing wall. It's amazing. You can take a, just a little bitty root of it. It'll grow a huge long vine. And it's like evergreen. Even after you cut it, it stays the same. And it's like a brush, folks. That's what it's like. And it's what they use back here to brush. Now, what did they have to do with those sacrifices before and when they were finished? Scrub them. They yeah. kept it hanging. In the law, you find instructions. They would take cedar wood, attach it to this thing, and make a brush, right? Come on, everybody in here. I know Lonnie skinned a deer, right? You skin a deer, Lonnie, when you're done, what you got to do? You got to clean up. Matter of fact, if you let the blood dry much, you're going to need a brush, aren't you? You got to scrub it. Well, that's what they scrubbed with. Anybody here like to be clean with a brush like that? Mm -hmm. That would hurt, wouldn't it? What did David say? Do it anyway. Yeah. Now, think about what he's saying. Wash me with the brush that's covered in the blood. Because that's what he's saying. Isn't the blood and the water always together? Look out here in the outer court. Can you have the water without the blood? No. Can't have it. You can have the blood, but without the water, you can have no uh, process with God, can you? So then when Jesus Christ came, the Bible says He came not by blood alone, but by blood and water, didn't it? When He, he died and they stuck that spear in His side and pulled it out, what come rushing out? Blood and water. This is what He came to atone and to cleanse. Now He says next, Purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Then, hey, he had whole bones before, didn't he? God broke them. Yep. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. 
Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. You hear what he's crying for? Renew means what? Regenerate. Regenerated. Then David, God saved man, had he done something that had made him un unfit and unclean? And what did he ask God to do? Clean him of it. Is God faithful and just to do it every time? Amen. Based on your prior performance? No. Based on what you promise you're going to do? No. Y'all know how many of us in our life have come to God with a deal. Now, I'm no. not the only one that's done this. No. Lord, I've done this thing. If you'll just get me out of this. Just this once. Just this once. I'll never again, right? Mm. Remember, uh, what was that we were watching, Lexi? Oh, that's John Wayne and uh, Rooster Cogburn. Mm -hmm. They're on that boat with Catherine Hepburn and they're going through the rapids and he said, Lord, if you get us out of this, I'll never take another drink. Remember that? Yeah. When they got off and they're wide the way, he pulls his cork out like that and she said, Reuben. And he looked there and he said, well, we wouldn't want to be fanatics, would we? <laughs> right? Ain't that kind of how me and you are? I mean, seriously, when we're in a jam, it's a serious deal. But once the jam's over, well, the Lord's not that strict. Come on now, we're talking about Jesus Christ. The one that died to pay for our sins. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then doesn't it uh, just seem completely logical to you that we ought to watch how we serve our Savior? Yes. Sure. And do you and I do things that bring shame on our Savior? Yes. We do. And that ought to be the thing we're the most shamed about. The fact that there are times when I've done something and someone could look and say, and that's one of those Christians. Now that's a horrible thing. Isn't it? Yeah. All right. Now, if you're sitting here, I might never see you again. I don't know. But if you're sitting here and you have never looked at the cross for what happened. On the cross, Jesus Christ had all sin put to His account. It matters not if you're the only human being that ever lived. Is your sin put to His account? Then He had to die, didn't He? Yeah. When He died, did that satisfy God's demands where your sins are? Does God require any further payment? What does God require of you today? Believe. believe. To believe what He did for you. The worst thing in the world, the worst sin, of, worse than murder, anything you could possibly think of, is to look on the death of Jesus Christ and not believe what it did for you. That is to absolutely receive the gift of God in vain, turn it away and say, I'll not have that. I'll do it my own way. And folks, the ones that want to do it their own way will have their way and God will not be unfair in letting them continue to go right to hell where they desire to go. There's nothing unfair in God's doctrine. God is perfectly right and every man gets exactly what he wants, I guarantee you. You want to do it yourself, you'll get what you want. And you want Jesus Christ to save you, believe on him now and you'll get what you want. Okay, any questions? Alright, thank you all very much. Thank you.